About 15 months ago, I was just sitting right where you are. Busy in schedule in between lectures, club activities, heading to the beach for some good surf or just fooling around town. What a good life, huh? Have you taken a moment today to just appreciate the opportunities we're given and living a fully self-determined life? Thank you, Jimmy, for the introduction. <laughs> My golden piggy tail. Yeah, there's actually a second fun fact I would like to share with you. I'm celebrating three birthdays a year. Now, the first one might seem fairly obvious, but what about the other two? It was a cloudy morning back in February 2013. I'd been seeing doctors with blood coughing and severe flank pain for months. And my breath was so short, I was only able to walk the eight meters from my bed to the toilet with oxygen in my nose. I was finally diagnosed with lupus and a blood clotting disorder, rare autoimmune disease which caused a severe lung embolism, requiring an open heart surgery during which my heart stopped beating. My second birthday. And in July last year, I was just thrilled to finally start my journey of living and studying in Rio de Janeiro, a double degree in international management. That would take me closer to my first career milestone of working in one of the big consulting firms. Like so many of you, I believe I was striving for a career in a high-performing environment, achieving steep learning curves, working on diverse projects, and a securing income. That sounds fairly good. But I also reflected and accepted for myself at the time that this would be a great trade-off for my social and leisure life. Intense working hours at the client's side for four days a week and my own ambition to outperform in front of managers and clients. That wouldn't leave much time to pursue my personal passions and spending time with the people that are most important to me. But a well-recognized job, an excellent salary, and especially this perspective to be working in my dream job one day in the management of a sports club, let me accept this faulty trade-off. Let's find our way to my third birthday. It was the 22nd of November last year. I almost faded out on the metro in Rio de Janeiro on my way to attend the last exam I needed to keep up the chance to get my double degree, which I wanted so badly. I finished the exam reading and writing just five centimeters of the paper because bleedings in my eyes had taken a major part of my eyesight. I was having heavy daily fevers, dripping night sweats, blood shortage, and I looked like a malnourished child, just very bony, only my belly heavily swollen. I wasn't closely able to live up this potential of this vibrant city. And reflecting now, I've never actually felt this weak in my life. But my willpower and unhealthy ignorance towards myself let me push through this time. The potentially best Brazilian doctors were unable to find the cause with these symptoms for four months. And it took the presence of my girlfriend to finally reflect that it was time to cut the cord and finish this chapter early by flying home. It was one of the toughest decisions I had to make because acknowledging that my body took dictatorship of my life's choices, wow. Just two weeks later, I was diagnosed with a very rare and aggressive form of blood cancer in the most advanced stage. Doctors told me there was a good 50% chance of surviving in the first five years, but 
grasping a view on my very specific disease and this patient case collection, I realized 16 out of the 20 people on this list died within the first five years. I felt empty. I felt disappointed that my life's plans for the next month were just shattered. Cancer. From there on, there was only one focus. My body, my recovery, surviving. And I'm sitting and smiling here today, just six months post my life-saving stem cell transplant given by a stranger who has given me a whole new perspective to life. My third birthday. And I'm so grateful nobody of you would be able to tell that my only focus in life for the past month since December has been, de has been surviving. Because cancer brand not me, but it doesn't define me. Today I would like to share with you how two life-threatening diseases let me build three building blocks of resilience. Let me experience my life's potential and also my shifted image of a satisfied life. Now, cancer brandmark these three building blocks of resilience. Acceptance, a positive mindset, and knowing to be majorly in charge of my very own body, let me on the one hand side never doubt achieving full recovery from cancer, and on the other hand, find my way back into a fully self-determined and especially satisfied life. Acceptance, the first building block. I had to accept that winning my greatest life challenge was only very partially in my own hands, though my physical and mental well-being were the things I considered still most in charge of. Though I also had to accept that life is finite. Probably one of the most character-shaping enlightenings. I had to accept that my chances of recovery are very poor. But hey, nature bet the odds of me being diagnosed with this specific form of blood cancer, which was 0.001%. So you name me one reason why I shouldn't achieve full-term, long-term recovery from this disease. I had to accept that there's no value in asking yourself, why me? Because cancer's effect, you cannot change. And since my lung embolism, I hardly ever wasted any energy on things and thoughts I cannot influence, or that ain't my business, because this just leads to deep inner serenity. So when you lie in bed tonight, just take a moment and reflect what you get furious about and whether it's worth it. I had to accept that my entire social environment was much more worried about my life than I was. I mean, my body was in deep pain, but I didn't feel deadly sick. But most people still only associate cancer with death. And facing myself in the mirror, I also had to accept that I hadn't been straight with myself for the last month since having these heavy symptoms. I feel very privileged to have been raised in such an opportunity-providing environment, but I hadn't been straight with myself, especially in terms of self-respect. I felt it so badly. I mean, I knew I was very sick, but I didn't take all actions that were in my hands to find out what it was. Why? Probably because it meant acknowledging that I would fail my study goal. I swore I would take any action and help to be accountable for myself again. Acceptance is just so important to come back stronger. 
second building block mindset. The day post diagnosis, I was just trying to sketch what really defined me. And it has always been the fire and motivation to strive for something bigger, to be aware of my body's potential to overcome and adapt to major challenges and trigger its as often hidden inner superpowers. One of the best examples, my handball career. It let me early develop a sense of the importance of loyal and quality relationships, experienced by the power of a sworn team against an objectively superior team. My passion for the sport, a sense of belonging, and the ability to push physical limits by overcoming mental limits were key for achieving my ambitious goals. Training and especially competition are my key for growth, now and then. No doctors expected me to get that physically fit again after my embolism, and they told me to pause my studies while receiving chemo for my lupus therapy here at Catholica. They are all experts in the field, and I highly appreciate their knowledge and help and advices, but in the end, we need to be able to read our body's signals and minds to be able to become aware of our very own abilities and ambitions in order to drive forward and develop an intrinsic drive to see our goals. This let me develop such positive mindset and strong resilience that thoughts about death didn't scare me and now even let me grow. The last building block, knowing to be majorly in charge of our very own body. Now, having lost dictatorship over my life's choices for the second time and facing death, it really made me seek any potential factor that could positively influence my recovery and take me back in charge of my very own body. There's nothing Nothing humans are more passionate about than surviving. My thirst for life, it was burning. And I was wondering what actually stopped me from being that ruthlessly bold and passionate when pursuing my dreams in the past. Now, despite considering myself fairly self-confident at the time, I presume I was just scared not to be good enough. And I was thinking I could experience rejection or not meet expectations. And this is just something that made me realize that asking strangers and friends for help always lets you take yourself closer to achieving your goals. There was a time three weeks post my stem cell transplant during which I had heavy daily fevers again and spastic in my limbs for about four weeks. Doctors, clueless. During that time, I actively had to accept that taking responsibility for myself meant resting my physical and mental ambitions to exercise because my body it needed all energy to recover. Patience was key. How often do you actively take a break and just focus on you and your body? In this uncertain time, remembering and visualizing my personal happy moments made me thrive. It was that campground we stayed in the wild nature of Canada 15 years ago with the family. The smell of large pine trees, the numbing feeling of ice cold water touching my feet and the sound of wild animals while we were watching the sparking campfire as it got dark. I just tried to trigger all senses possible to blur the lines between visualization and reality. And it worked. The doubts and fears risen by doctors' cluelessness faded. And 
visualization has now become a daily routine for me. It helps me to self-reflect, trigger inner healing, and take actions. Now, let's talk about a satisfying life. This time on the stem cell ward was probably one of the most demanding, but also most impactful for my life. For about six weeks after being discharged from hospital, I felt like my brain was just in a delusion. I wasn't able to process this avalanche of daily information we are confronted with. And then there was a mild night in May. I woke up around 2.30 a.m. And all of a sudden, I felt like there was oxygen in my brain cells again. This wild mix of thoughts, ideas, and doubts. It gave me a feeling that I actually gained back dictatorship over my mind. What if I stick to my goals and imagine myself in two years' time and cancer is back? Would I be ready to leave this world fully satisfied? Nah. Considering the trade-off I choose for my former career path, what are actually the basis factors defining our career goals, which often also heavily frame our life goals? Now, first of all, I believe we're inspired. We're inspired in the early years, especially by our parents, and we adapt while unconsciously playing the trial and error game on a daily basis. We keep doing what we're good at with full emotions and we develop personal interests based on the born given strength. And considering, considering that, we're living in a time in which we have as much access to inspiring content as never. There's one like people climbing the Everest, there's multi-billion dollar entrepreneurs and all these social media influencers who never tend to have a bad day. I mean, we have the opportunity to get inspired by an amazing world's community. But what does that actually mean for us and what consequences does it have? Don't we sometimes just try to copy and be inspired by the great perspective we inspire with from others without critically self-reflecting whether this is actually matching our born given strength. The diagnosis was a wake up call to take full responsibility for myself and take a step back to critically self-reflect how I was affected and had faultly adapted bits and pieces of all the intoxicating, inspiring content that is surrounding us daily. I reflect content a lot more critical now and try to match it with my personal interests and strength to live a life in which I can trigger the emotions in the moment. And I believe that this will be impactful for myself and others. And let me look at back at this in two years' time, satisfied. Because leaving this world Letting people remember how you made them feel, how I made them feel, is what I aim for. Not being an, at any time, replaceable workhorse. Claiming help and helping others will be just key to pursue my dreams without major detours. But before being able to help and take responsibility and give back to the world society, which triggers so much joy in us, I really have to take a break, daily. I have to take a pause to not forget about my developed inner serenity, my self-love, my freedom, and especially be aware of my comfort zone. To push adventurously out of it from time to time, because comfort is good, it's important, but creating happy moments, it ain't gonna happen alone and bad. 
I won't take bad compromises and find excuses for things I'm in majorly in charge of anymore. Imagining myself to only live, live two years' time, it's a blink. Pursuing my former first career milestone of being a consultant would neither satisfy my experiencing nor my remembering self, said in Daniel Kahneman's word. Meaning, I would have neither enjoyed the daily job nor the memory of the time. So why choose money and perspective over freedom and satisfaction? Now, this is me. This is my perspective. However, there's people out there who are exactly passionate about this. And that is good because they have passion for it. And in the most challenging days, it wasn't any materialistic item. It was these crazily adventurous memories that kept me thriving. This learning makes me cheer my third birthday even more. So let's focus on exploring new grounds and dictating our life's choices with pure passion today. The clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you.